Thank you all for coming. And it's a great pleasure to have Sarah Catanzaro, uh, general partner at Amplify Partners. Sarah is a highly renowned name in the venture capital space in the data engineering, ML ops, data analytics space. And I've known her for like three years now, meeting at many conferences in the database venues, ML systems venues. So she has a deep insider view of the industry in this space and what are the open problems? What are the things that startups are trying to tackle? So she'd like to give us an overview of what is happening today and where she thinks the biggest gaps still are. So thank you for visiting us and sharing your insights with us, Sarah. Of Please course, I'm looking forward to, to chatting. Um, all of those precautions still apply. Hopefully though, at least like some of you can see my slides now. Um, I am still, Sarah Catanzaro, still a general partner at Amplify Partners. Um, and as I was saying before, you know, Amplify is an early stage venture capital firm. We focus specifically on investing in technical tools and platforms. So most of the companies that we're investing in, they're using uh, machine intelligence or distributed systems or data management. And they're primarily building data and ML tools and platforms, enterprise infrastructure and developer tools. Um, so for those of you who are not super familiar with the venture capital model, uh, VCs basically exchange capital and expertise for ownership in companies, uh, which means that you know, we, we uh, provide both like strategic guidance and advice to our portfolio companies, we invest money in them. And in exchange, we are minority owners of their businesses. Amplify's model is a little bit different in that we tend to concentrate capital. And so what that means is that we double down on our own portfolio. So we'll make an initial investment, but then we'll continue to invest in the same set of companies as they grow. And so what that means is that I actually only do about like one to four deals a year. So contrary to what people might think about venture capital, you might think, you know, for example, that I'm looking at hundreds of companies in any given year. Um, I'm really not. I actually spend far more of my time with my current portfolio companies and uh, liaising with people in industry to really better understand what are the challenges that they have? What are the opportunities that they're excited about? And also spending time in academia to kind of better understand what technical systems are being developed that can address some of those challenges and opportunities. So today I'm going to share kind of what I've learned from many of those conversations with people in industry. Uh, as a caveat, I probably spend more of my time talking with uh, mid-market and um, earlier stage public companies, companies like uh, Stitch Fix or companies like Zillow versus like Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. The challenges that a lot of the like Fing or Magna companies have, whatever they're called nowadays, uh, frankly, I think they're fundamentally different just given the scale of those businesses. Okay, so you know what have I learned uh, through these conversations so far? Um, as a bit of additional background, I actually used to work as a data scientist. So I started my career in the defense and intelligence sector, working on computational models of insurgencies. Subsequently, moved into startups, where I uh, most recently led the data science and ML team at a company called Mattermark. And when I'm thinking about the ML stack today. Now, often I'm thinking about like what has changed since I was an operator, since I was leading a data science team. And I think a lot has actually changed for the better, um, but a lot has not changed too. Now, one of the things that I think has changed for the better is that we're starting to identify ways to kind of link business value with machine learning. So, you know, four or five years ago, often people would approach me and say like, I've got all of this data. How do I apply AI? And, and like that is completely the wrong framing. I think the right framing is to think about like what are the high priority business problems that I have and what are the resources that I have with regards to data compute, talent, et cetera? And how do I use machine learning to solve my high priority business problems? Now that that transition from thinking about like business 
problems as the goal. Uh, that has started to happen and I think is well underway. The other thing that we see is that a lot of the high value ML use cases, they're emerging along industry lines. So if you're in e-commerce, the likelihood that you can use ML to improve your search and recommendation systems, thereby driving increased revenue is pretty high. And this is important because it has actually de-risked ML in significant ways. If you're in finance, you no longer need to really think about like, what are the best ways for me to leverage machine learning? The likelihood that you implement a ML driven fraud detection system, and it leads to better outcomes for your business is pretty high. Um, kind of in a similar vein, I think we've started to see SaaS applications, things like uh, customer relationship managers like Salesforce or customer support desks like Zendesk, where they're not just using AI as this like magical pixie dust, they're actually using ML in like really strategically significant ways to change the way in which their users interface with their product and to make their workflows a lot more efficient. Uh, one example that I give is an Amplify portfolio company called Runway ML. They use machine learning to automate a lot of aspects of the uh, video editing process. So that's good. Um, one thing that I think is somewhat underappreciated is that most of the machine learning that we see in industry today is still classical methods applied to structured data. So, you know, my estimate would be that 90% of ML use cases today are, again, you know, things like decision trees applied to either time series data or tabular data, uh, which is a very different picture than you might imagine if you're reading about you know, GPT-3 and everything that is happening in, in image recognition, natural language understanding. We'll talk more about why that might be the case later. Uh, the only other comment that I'd make here is that we're starting to see some companies actually embed their structured data, uh, which is perhaps like one step towards unstructured data. Uh, so on a positive note, I think most companies at this point above a certain size have hired at least one ML practitioner, and they're starting to expand their ML teams uh, pretty meaningfully. But, you know, a challenge that both industry participants face as well as tool builders face is that they're organizing their ML teams in, in very different ways. In fact, you know, as I was on uh, the flight here yesterday, a friend who leads the ML team team at a company called Sumo Logic, they offer uh, software application monitoring, was emailing me saying like, hey, do you have any resources on how to organize ML teams? I can't find anything. It's kind of wild that, you know, we're, we're eight years into this, this deep learning hype cycle, and there's still no resources on how to organize ML teams. Okay. So I want to start to talk about kind of the key challenges that practitioners face in industry. Um, but before doing so, I think it's really important to kind of establish a common framework for you know, any dialogue about the ML stack, any dialogue that can kind of uh, inform how we're thinking about the problems that uh, continue today and uh, the solutions that you know, potential vendors are, are addressing. So this, it's not there. <laughs> uh, this slide that I see in front of me, uh, this is from a report that another investor, Matt Turk at First Mark puts together every year. This is apparently like the ML landscape. And if you're looking at this as like a student, an investor, a potential buyer, a potential startup founder, like it is, it is nearly impossible to make sense of. Like there are just so many tools and vendors. Uh, you know, I think we need to think about the ML stack in terms of like the layers of the stack, so that we can really think more strategically about where some of these problems are arising, and what types of solutions are necessary. So when I'm investing, I tend to think about the ML stack as really being composed of these three layers of data management, build and deploy solutions and model operations, 
data management is somewhat self-explanatory. Well, frankly, they're all self-explanatory, but data management relates to how we are managing uh, training data sets, predictions, labels, the, the data artifacts that uh, go into building and maintaining ML models. Build and deploy is primarily the set of tools that are used to uh, train models and then subsequently deploy them. And model operations are the set of tools that are used to maintain models in production. So just uh, gave you a sense of like what I see in terms of the data management layer. Often these are tools that are designed to help ML practitioners and others manage their underlying training data sets. Uh, as well as like predictions and gold data and you know, sometimes features and labels as well, depending on the model architecture. Now, I think one of the more interesting phenomena that I see is happening in databases right now. So there's kind of a 50-50 split between how companies are, are managing the data that they leverage for machine learning. So in a bit, we'll talk a little bit about like the quote unquote modern data stack. Um, this is a suite of tools that are really designed to facilitate reporting and business intelligence and analytics. And um, some companies, I think they're recognizing that they're putting all of this effort into their analytics platforms. They're, they're building core data models. They're testing, monitoring, documenting these data sets. And since they're investing so much in these data sets for analytics, they can actually think about repurposing them for machine learning as well. And so they're using their data warehouse not only for you know, measurement and reporting, but also as the kind of system of record for the data sets that feed into their ML models. Alternatively, I also see other companies that may have a analytic stack that really centers upon the data warehouse but are, that, are building an ML stack on a data lake. And I think that the primary advantage of the data lake is that you can store both structured and unstructured data uh, relatively cheaply. And uh, many of the data lake vendors, they also provide a kind of better Python experience. Uh, the experience of using Python on the data warehouse is still pretty bumpy. That said, you know, with the data lake, you end up maintaining two different stacks, one purpose built for ML, one purpose built for analytics. So there's possibly duplication of effort. The thing that we see kind of up and coming, uh, primarily for uh, search and recommendation systems is the use of vector databases. Uh, these are databases that are purpose built to manage embeddings. So, once you have transformed your data into features, there may be a different set of tools that you need to actually manage the features. Again, here I see a split between two different approaches. Uh, the feature store is a system that is purpose built to solve challenges that are really unique to online ML systems, uh, those that are leveraging you know, streaming real time data. And so they, they kind of include uh, solutions to manage things like offline, online inconsistency, the inconsistencies that arise between your training data set and your serving data set. Uh, they may also provide additional benefits like accurate backfill. So if you're adding a new feature, you don't then have to like wait several months for uh, the data to populate. You can backfill that transformation and feel confident that it would match you know, what you would otherwise see in production. Some companies though are not doing online machine learning and uh, don't actually need to solve these problems around online offline inconsistencies and accurate backfill, but they do need to make their features available to the machine learning model in a very fast, low latency way. Um, and so instead of implementing a full feature store, they're uh, implementing what you might call like a feature layer, a feature proxy, where they're transferring their data from an analytical data warehouse, which is really optimized for uh, reads to a key value store that is more optimized for like product and application use cases. The last set of tools that I see in this category are data labeling tools. Uh, these include you know, companies like Scale and Labelbox 
that are building tools that make it easier to label data. They also tend to provide uh, labeling services. So if you want you know, a set of 20 people to label your data for you, they'll provide that as a service. I think one of the more exciting uh, spaces within the data management layer two is weak supervision, where you're writing rules, acknowledging that those rules are not going to lead to perfect labels, but you're using probabilistic programming such that you can still train models to a high degree of fidelity. So the build and deploy stack really relates more to, again, how, how companies are training and deploying their, their ML models. Um, there's some very unfortunate naming conventions in this space. Pretty much every data science framework nowadays is called something flow, which is somewhat natural in that like most of these frameworks enable you to transport your data science projects into DAGs or workflows. So I guess the flow is associated with workflow, uh, Metaflow, ML, Kubeflow. These are all uh, data science frameworks, some of which are also workflow orchestrators that are purpose-built for machine learning. There are other types of workflow orchestrators that enable you to transform a software project into a workflow that can then be scheduled and orchestrated on cloud resources, things like Airflow, but those are not necessarily like purpose-built for machine learning, deep learning. Increasingly, what I'm seeing with frameworks like Metaflow and MLflow is that they also include uh, experiment tracking and version control capabilities. So by uh, enabling logging and collecting metadata related to those workflows, they enable you to compare machine learning experiments so that you can more easily see uh, what you know, each model architecture, uh, how it performed or, or how models performed when trained on different data sets and things of that nature. Uh, the experiment tracking, I think, is really key to enabling faster iteration and you know, therefore faster development cycles. Version control tends to take like one of two forms or both. You see version control tools for versioning your models so that you know, you know what version of a model led to what outcome. You can have multiple versions of a model running in production, sometimes on different traffic. So maybe you have a uh, model that is going to be uh, driving the recommendation carousel for the US market and another for the Asian market. You also see version control tools for data sets. Within the auto ML space, there are a lot of tools that are designed to, not surprisingly, automate aspects of uh, machine learning. Um, I've got I've got thoughts on auto ML and and you know low code no code tools. I think a lot of auto ML tools have been designed to really enable non experts to build ML models. Um, but building an ML model does not just mean coding. It, it really requires, as you all know, like being a students of data science, a more nuanced understanding about how to examine data, how to think about like the connection between inputs and outputs, how to think about things like distribution shift. So my take on, on you know, auto ML platforms that uh, try to transfer work to a less technical user is that they're really just shifting the burden of work. Like when many companies adopt auto ML platforms, their data scientists just end up like fixing other people's work. So they spend their time fixing instead of building. And I'm not sure that's really creating value, but there are also auto ML tools that are designed for more expert practitioners. And many of these are really intended to kind of automate the more tedious aspects of model building, whether it's uh, model architecture search or hyperparameter optimization. So I, again, my take is that like auto ML used in service of the expert practitioner is probably uh, more value generating. And the last category of things are, are tools for distributed training. Um, one of the kind of core challenges, and we'll talk about this more later in machine learning, is enabling faster iteration. You don't know a priori if something is going to work, and so you want to be able to fail fast. I think like initially when I 
heard about distributed training uh, frameworks or, or the, these kind of like parallel computing engines. I was somewhat skeptical because, you know, what's the difference between a model that takes an hour to train and one that takes six hours to train? But I think that the key here is that like these tools enable you to build faster, to, to try things faster, and therefore can really help companies determine what might work, what might not work, and drive progress forward in a field that is really uh, highly uncertain. Okay. The last category of tools that we can talk through is uh, for model operations. Um, building models is hard. Like, I, I, I don't think that there is any aspect of machine learning that is still easy today. The, the model architectures have advanced in very meaningful ways, but uh, building software systems uh, based on machine learning models is challenging from start to finish. Model operations, I think, is one of the most challenging areas, in part because the way in which we train and tune models is very different than how models are expected to work in production environments. So more often than not, you're, you're training and evaluating models on static data sets, and then you're deploying them into production environments. And the thing about the real world is that like everything shifts. I think there might be some people that tell you that you know ML is better suited to use cases like facial recognition, where you'd expect less domain shift, but even faces shift over time. Uh, so ensuring that you can detect these shifts and adapt to these shifts, ensuring that your model is not using protected attributes, I think all of these things are really challenging. So this category includes you know, some of these monitoring tools, as well as some tools that are really designed to enable you to uh, deploy models to cloud resources, but also optimize those models so that they can meet the requirements of the software application. You know, if you're if you're building a pricing model for Uber, like you don't want to have to wait five minutes just to get the predicted price for your ride. Um, the other categories here are model compliance, you know, again, ensuring that that uh, protected attributes are not used uh, when you develop these prediction services. And the last, again, which I'm pretty excited about is continuous learning. If the real world shifts and if we can expect everything to, to you know, drift over time, then the best way to counter that phenomena is just to retrain as frequently as possible and retraining as frequently as possible ultimately leads you down the path of active learning where you're effectively retraining on each example. Okay, so with that framework in mind, I think we can talk a little bit about the, the challenges that ML practitioners face. And again, I'm, I'm presenting this, this taxonomy not only to provide you with an overview of the type of tools that I see, but so that we can start to talk about like where the gaps are and how we might solve them using a common language. So I think I've alluded to this a couple of times, but one of the biggest challenges that I see in ML right now is just scoping projects. Um, when you talk to you know product teams or, or product engineering teams in industry about traditional software development, they have very well understood tools, not just for uh, determining if something will be successful or if something is feasible, but also how long it might take, uh, what sort of resources are required, what sort of headcount you might need. And a lot of that is kind of completely missing in the ML space. If you are embarking on uh, building a product classification model, you don't know necessarily if it is even possible to achieve the accuracy that is required to, to implement that tool in production when you start that project. And from a company perspective where you have limited resources, starting a project that might just fail is a really risky proposition. So 
this I think has really bottlenecked a lot of ML projects. The the fact that like we don't know if they will succeed or what is required to make the project successful. Now, and I talked about this a bit when we were discussing uh, build and deploy tools, including tools for distributed training. The way around this is to enable companies to fail fast. Like if you don't know if an ML project will be successful or not a priori, but you know that if it's not successful, you'll find out within half a day or you'll find out within a day, then you are able to take on riskier and riskier projects, knowing that the cost of failure is not significantly high. I'm starting to see some tools like these distributed computing frameworks that are enabling companies to fail fast. But I think a lot of this also relates to the processes that companies implement. My favorite kind of hack in this domain is seeing companies uh, try to operationalize randomly weighted models. So before they do any additional hyperparameter tuning, they will kind of build the systems that are required to operate that model in production so they can determine if you know it is possible to address the latency requirements the performance requirements the scalability requirements um, and that kind of enables both their engineering and data science teams to work in tandem more effectively so i i mentioned that you know model operations is where a lot of pain is accruing um, I think that's where pain is accruing right now, where pain has accrued over time is the data management layer. While transformer architectures, I do think radically change uh, companies' data management needs. Uh, no longer do you need kind of a very wide corpus of, of training data. Instead, you can leverage pre-trained models with a smaller but specific corpus of, of data for fine tuning. Um, accessing high quality data, evaluating the impact of new data sets on model performance and working with unstructured data are still really, really hard for practitioners. So access to high quality data, like, gosh, this is probably a problem that people have been working on for 50 years or so. And like, there's still these fundamental issues of like, how do you find data sets? If you're a new data scientist at Facebook, how do you know what data is available to you when you're beginning a new ML project? If you're able to find those data sets, how do you trust that the data is high quality enough that you can build a model that you're going to be able to run in production? Um, a lot of the problems that you know, needed to be solved in order to do better reporting, better uh, business intelligence, better experimentation, like we're just solving these problems now. So it, it remains kind of a blocker for practitioners. I think what you see when you talk to people both in academia and industry is more of a shift from like model-based machine learning to data-based machine learning. The idea is that like the best way to improve model performance is actually by iterating on the data sets upon which the model is trained not just by iterating on the model architecture or hyperparameters. Uh, there, there is probably a lot of truth to that, although there are certain people who would uh, disagree with, with kind of that type of framing. And regardless of how you think we should approach optimizing models, um, I think most can agree like that that process needs to be simpler. Like it should be relatively easy both to find data sets that could potentially improve model performance, but also to evaluate the impact of a new data set on model performance without retraining the entire system. So I think this is one of the spaces where like the build and deploy layer potentially relates to the data management layer. You should be able to build and deploy models experimenting with new data sets relatively relatively quickly so that you can understand the impact or estimate the impact of a data set on model performance without going through that full retraining process. Uh, and lastly, unstructured data wrangling. So, so like if you are working on some sort of forecasting model and you want to better understand like uh, previous behavior, 
SQL is an amazing tool. Like you can just write queries to collect these summary statistics so that you can quickly build an intuition for the underlying data set and then determine you know, what model architecture is best suited to this data set, uh, what pre-processing or post-processing steps might you need and so on and so forth. If you have a corpus of 5,000 legal contracts and these legal contracts are each 50 pages long, like how do you build an intuition for that data set? You're not going to like look at a sample and read you know, 100 of these contracts, maybe you will, but that, that would take a long time. Um, I think a lot of companies, earlier I'd said that like they've built a strong intuition for high ROI use cases like search and recommendation and fraud detection. I think a lot of companies are sitting on unstructured data, but they don't know what's there and therefore they can't reason about how they might use it. And this is really blocking the spread of these transformer architectures and other things like GPT-3 that could potentially have a big impact on industry if only we better understood what data we had. So I had mentioned that like this is actually one of my favorite slides in the entire deck. When we talk about machine learning, I think we often talk about the challenge of building and deploying ML. We might even talk about the, the challenge of like data management and uh, building and deploying. What we don't talk about is that ML systems look like this. ML systems don't look like you know, this little hexagon here that says ML algorithm. Uh, machine learning models, like even if containerized, it's just a prediction service. And it's a prediction service that needs to connect to other data sets. This here, so for context, this is uh, actually from a like 2014 blog post by Netflix. I believe it was on their recommendation models. And one can only assume that their uh, software application architecture has become even more complex. Um, but if you look at, again, the schematic, you can see that they're connecting to at least one, two, three, four different data stores. They need to connect to an event processing system. They need to connect to a UI client. Uh, there's offline data sets, there's online data sets. There are different runtimes. Like this is what building ML systems looks like. And we wonder why companies are struggling to operationalize their machine learning models. It's because they're not just operationalizing a model, they're building a software application for which a model is one component, and then trying to iterate on that component while understanding the behavior of this entire complex system. Like this is really hard. And I think this is hard in a traditional software application context. It's much harder when the thing you know, at its core, when this ML algorithm is far more complex than a heuristic based piece of software. Okay, so I don't know if you've had to uh, go to lectures on like managing Kubernetes yet. We were talking about Kubernetes earlier. It is a beast, like that is one gnarly piece of software. It is so complex. And it is so complex because it was designed to orchestrate workloads at a very complex company, you know, which is Google and Alphabet. Um, one of the things that really disappoints me in the data science and ML space is that every year when I look at job recs for data scientists, the number of bullets just keeps going up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've seen this too. Like, and and, and like. The bullets don't have anything to do with data science. Like companies are looking for people who have experienced managing Kubernetes clusters. They're looking for people with experience leveraging workflow orchestration systems like Airflow. They want people with experience using different types of query engines and analytics engines. And none of this is actually data science. Like data science, math, statistics, analysis, modeling. And while I think it's important to have you know, some understanding of these other types of software systems, you should also have like the freedom to cultivate your expertise in your own domain. And time spent learning how to operate Kubernetes is time that is not being spent 
learning about new model architectures or thinking about kind of the best data management systems to support your model and things of that nature. So I am of the strong belief that like data scientists should not have to spend time managing environments and, and comp computing resources. And for that reason, I recently invested in a company called Modal Labs. It was founded by Eric Bernardson, who's the former CTO of Better. He experienced this problem very acutely in his role there, as well as Akshat Bubna, who was uh, one of the founding engineers at a company called Scale. I would tell you more about them, but this is being recorded and uh, it's a stealth company. So <laughs> unfortunately, I can't do that today. Okay, how are we on time? Uh, we've got about 10 minutes, so I'll just kind of talk through this fairly quickly so that you know we can do Q a um, So I'm investing in in startups, and I'm investing primarily in startups that are trying to solve these problems that I just discussed. Um, it's really hard for them right now, and I think things are changing, but there are a couple of things that need to happen before ML tools and platforms are able to really like scale and gain widespread adoption. Uh, so at Amplify I tend to focus on both the data analytics stack and the ML stack. And there are a couple of phenomena that I saw within the analytics landscape that I think really unlocked the potential of companies like Snowflake or DBT, a data modeling framework, or Fivetran, all of which are multi-billion dollar companies today. So here, somewhere here i have kind of a schematic of the modern data stack and what you see is that like it's cohesive it is easy to understand what is going on here you have a set of data sources you use an elt tool to extract and load that data you load it into the data warehouse you transform it within the data warehouse you might do additional denormalization or aggregation to transform that data into metrics and then you consume those metrics through a analytics and BI tool, maybe through a reverse ETL tool that pipes it into other applications uh, or through a data science tool. It's cohesive. If you talk to most people in the analytics space, they will describe exactly the same stack. That's not true in machine learning. Like in ML, if you talk to five different ML engineers about the ML stack, they will describe five completely different designs. And this is really challenging for tool builders because they don't know what space they occupy in the stack. They don't know what problem specifically they're solving relative to other companies. I think there've been a couple of things that we saw in the uh, analytics stack that really kind of paved the way for the rise of these other tools and platforms. The first of which was that a system of record emerged. So uh, let's see, it was like eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, like cloud data warehouses started to really gain adoption. And it wasn't just any cloud data warehouse. Specifically, there was a lot of consolidation around Redshift, Snowflake, and BigQuery. Now Firebolt is emerging as a new uh, challenger. But because so many companies were using BigQuery Redshift and Snowflake, new vendors were able to emerge that could just sit on top of those platforms. They didn't have to integrate with you know, 50, 60 different underlying data stores. They could just integrate with the analytics data warehouse and you know, offer services from there. The next thing that happened was really kind of a consolidation around like a set of best practices. One example that I'd give is the shift from ETL to ELT. So instead of transforming data before it was stored in the data warehouse, companies started transforming data within the data warehouse. Now that created opportunities both for ELT vendors as well as data transformation vendors. And now for uh, companies that are building applications like experimentation platforms or uh, BI platforms on top of the data warehouse, that are just interfacing with the transformed data, which is difficult to get into legacy vendors. Um, so that change in behavior and that set of best practices also created opportunity for companies. 
The other thing that I think happened is that a new role emerged. So I'm not sure if, if uh, people have talked about the position of like the analytics engineer, but in the past you know, four to five years, we've just seen an explosion in the number of companies that are hiring analytics engineers. And analytics engineers are specifically responsible not for producing analysis, but rather for modeling data within the data warehouse and then automating repeat analysis. So the fact that we now have a clear set of workflows, a clear set of roles and a system of record, I think enables you to have you know, these billion dollar companies that all emerge in the ML space or in the analytics space. So you know, when I contrast the ML space, like what is the system of record for ML? Is it the data warehouse? Is it the data lake? Is it the feature store? Is it experiment tracking? I don't think anybody really knows. And therefore it's hard to think about what you're going to build on top of. When you don't know what you're going to build on top of, I think it naturally leads you to build an end-to-end -end platform. And so if we're to go back to, you know, this slide, my guess is that like, you know, 50% of these companies say that they're ML platforms and not like companies that are solving a well-scoped problem. You know, similarly, a lot of the analytics tools today, like they're fun to use, they're, they're really enjoyable and they're enjoyable because they align with the way that you work, but because data scientists and ML engineers are not really working in consistent ways, it's hard to build tools that really align with, with their behaviors. So many of these tools, many of these ML tools, they require you to change the way that you work in order to adopt them, which means that like, they're just not fun to use. They kind of suck. Uh, lastly, I think one of the, the kind of big sources of tension in industry today is this question of, should data scientists build, deploy, and operate models in production? So should they work end to end? Or should they be paired with an ML engineer such that the data scientist is responsible for uh, building the model, but then somebody else is responsible for deploying it into production and maintaining it in production? And without clarity on which of those two models is the better one, it's really hard to even answer the question of like, for whom are you building this tool? I kind of addressed some of these questions around like why everything becomes a platform. Everything is a platform nowadays. Uh, I hope and I see that we're starting to gain clarity into some of these patterns. I think I've seen much more uh, crystallization around the pattern wherein data scientists work closely with ML engineers. And I think as some of those changes happen, particularly as we answer this question of what might be the system of record for machine learning, we'll be able to move away from like this end-to-end -end platform or all-in-one suite to something that is more best of breed. You know, the final question that I don't have an answer to is, will there be a canonical ML stack? Uh, image recognition problems, like they're very different from NLP problems, and those are very different from time series forecasting problems. And so I think you know, that this, this idea that maybe ml is not like analytics maybe we will see that there there are you know four or five ml stacks that are purpose built for different applications or different model architectures it's a you know, real possibility so i'm probably almost over time uh but we've got you know, five minutes or so for questions and uh I'll take it from here okay um Let's go better around the block.